Well, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to you and welcome to the Illuminated Theatre for the first of our Cunard Insights programmes today. It's my great pleasure to welcome our keynote speaker and adventurer who sailed to seven seas and dozens of rivers in various vessels, from sea schooners in the Pacific to kayaks in the Amazon and icebreakers in Antarctica. He's voyaged extensively in the Atlantic Ocean along the eastern seaboard of the United States and Canada, where we are now navigating. A river navigation specialist, uh, he's especially at home on China's Yangtze River, about which he's written several works, including Yangtze River Map, From Source to Sea, and Three Gorges of the Yangtze River. He's also written the Coastal Harbor Guide to the United States, soon to be published on CD for electronic navigation. He's been featured uh, presenter in the United Nations, the Explorers Club, the Society of Naval Architects, and numerous universities. His home port is New York and the Hudson River, where he is a skipper of a historic English Channel yawl, Clang the Second, a sail ferry built in 1924. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our keynote speaker, Captain Richard Heyman. <coughs> Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to be here on this great ship in my rather familiar waters. As Paul said, I've worked uh, all around the world and have been a, a, both a, a small boat uh, adventurer in my own sea kayak, and then I've worked on many different ships, and currently I'm captain of a research vessel called the Heraclitus, which is in the Mediterranean. And if you know the Greek philosopher, his primary ethos was that there is nothing more constant than change. And so today I'm going to talk about this great ocean, the Atlantic, which is our home pond. Those of us who live on it know that it is a very tempestuous sea. Uh, you don't be fooled by today's weather. And I know you, many of you came on the crossing over, which was a little bumpy. But uh, now we're in the, uh, let's say, the tropical zone of Canada, so it's uh, nice and balmy for a while. And this uh, ocean is characterized by, first of all, it, it is vast, but uh, getting a little more vast. It is almost a quarter of the world's ocean, as it's called by oceanographers, as we are all island dwellers, really. And then it is, the North Atlantic alone is three times the size of North America. And I'm going to show you a few features of it, because this ocean, unlike the Pacific, is actually expanding and growing about a centimeter a year because of the continental drift that we can all, if you're very quiet, you can hear it happening on the shore. But um, this, this sea was, of course, legendary. And in a sense, the, uh, the Atlantic is the birthplace of our modern civilization because it, crossing the Atlantic uh, was the great feat of the European explorers, and before them, perhaps some African explorers, and back into prehistory, transmigration across the Atlantic led to the combination of peoples. And in our modern times, Africa, Europe, and the Americas joined their peoples to become, oh, the hybrid world that we live in today. But uh, in just in the literary history of the Atlantic, which I recommend the book uh, by Simon Winchester about the Atlantic. It is about the peoples of the common shared ocean and the shore, but um, John Milton in Paradise Lost uh, wrote, over all the face of the earth, main ocean flowed, not idle, but with warmth, prolific humor softening all her globe, fermented the great mother to conceive, satiate with genial moisture, when God said, be gathered now, ye waters under heaven, into one place, the great receptacle of congregated waters he called seas. Now that is a very benign view of what is often a very rough and dangerous place, and you can imagine all of the travelers, or really the explorers and merchant ships that came across where we are passing, especially on the crossing, and lost their way and foundered on this very shores where we have just passed. And so it is in history, uh, considered a feat of navigation and uh, courage to cross, even not so long ago on a liner where the accommodations were not quite were used to on this great ship. And as time has gone on, it has become an ordinary joy to cross the Atlantic. Now, I'm going to show you various oceanographic pictures. Now, this is just the, uh, the bathyspheric view of the Atlantic. And uh, the, the great feature of the Atlantic is that it's actually almost two oceans, because right at the e equator, uh, it is divided 
neatly into the North and the South Atlantic, and the, and the currents and the winds all change. Uh, and in the North Atlantic, of course, you have a great uh, clockwise spiral of both wind and current that, that features the warm water that comes to the north coasts of Europe. And you can see that the, there are all of these different abyssal plains and then shelves and uh, banks, troughs. And so the study of oceanography when you are studying the ground bottom of the ocean is remarkable how many geographic features are down there. And they're often very rugged and very deep and unknown to this point. And so as we go and find out more about what is between the land masses, we are quite surprised by the variety of sea bottom and then also the life that's on it. So going off from northern Europe, you have Iceland and you have these great ridges, uh, channels, the uh, Denmark channels between Iceland and Greenland, for instance, which is famously rough and difficult to cross in previous eras. And then you come down into the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which is one of the largest features in all of the world, 14,000 mile stretch of mountains. And that's where the continents are still spreading apart. There's still volcanic eruptions, earthquakes. And that is an area of such a rugged sea bottom that it's a great vast canyon land with fracture zones. You see the Barracuda fracture, various other ones that are features that we have only mapped in the most general way. But then again, there's more always to find out down there. And now it's done a lot, but largely with um, remote operated vessels, ROVs, that go down and can see things. And this area off the north coast of Africa with Madeira and the Canary Islands, Cape Verde Islands, is a great extension of the continental plain with these seamounts and also active volcanoes. For instance, in the Canary Islands, the island of uh, San Jorge is arising out of the sea as we speak, and there are uh, faults and earthquakes in that area. As you go over to the uh, Caribbean side, first of all, you have the Sargasso Sea, which is the great calm gyre in the middle of the central North Atlantic. But as you come up into the North American coast, you get again the continental shelves, abyssal plains, which are usually 3,000 meters deep, and then they slowly rise to the shore. The C uh, Caribbean Sea, which is its own central uh, area between the islands. And notice that the Milwaukee Deep is the deepest part of all of the North Atlantic at 28,000 more feet. It's over 8,000 meters. And that is one of the fracture zones where islands have risen and fallen because of the volcanic activity. Now all of this ocean is actually new compared to the Pacific, which still has original primordial crust, but the Atlantic was originally part of the Pangaea, the giant supercontinent that in the Jurassic period over 150 million years ago about began to spread and then pull apart North America, Africa, South America. And so the neat fitting of particularly South America and Brazil with Africa is sort of a well-known geographic feature that uh, even children can understand the continents spread and left the land masses like a puzzle pulled apart. And in where I live on the Hudson River, uh, there is a cliff which is geologically drawn from the same rock that is apparent on the shores of Morocco. Now this is what happened over millions of years and it continues to happen. The continents spread, the oceans come in and then create the land masses we know today. Note that uh, North and South America were not connected until in geological time uh, fairly recently. As the continents pulled apart, the fracture zone on the Pacific side with its volcanic activity, which continues to this day, rose Central America up and cut the Central Atlantic from the Pacific Ocean. And this was considered to be a very uh, dramatic event climatically by geophysicists that when the flow between the Proto-Atlantic and the Pacific was blocked by land, that changed the, the global climate of the Northern Hemisphere and it's surmised that perhaps that's why North Africa became a desert, because of the change in the winds, the currents. And that, of course, led the primates to move, which may be why we're here today. But that's a sort of grand speculation. But nonetheless, you can see the separation of the continents and the spreading of the Atlantic uh, on a voyage, particularly up to Iceland. You see the mid-Atlantic ridge goes all the way from the Arctic all the way down to the Antarctic. And that is then matched by different plates that are slowly moving. The 
Caribbean plate to South American, and then Europe versus Africa. If you've been to Iceland, you know that's the, the great dramatic land and uh, the uh, fire and the ice that are actively part of this great rift zone and the Denmark channel to the west. And under the sea, you have this kind of topography, which is if whatever was quite visible, it's quite dramatic. These uh, great mountain chains all through the sea that are then only seen visibly when the, it's above sea level. And of course, Iceland is a, a very variegated island with uh, sort of frozen deserts, great rifts, uh, volcanoes like the Egenfjord. We had that problem a few years ago, which then cut through the glaciers and then make these great uh, phenomena of the ice tubes. If you ever want to go on an excur excursion in Iceland, uh, be sure to wear a sweater. And uh, it's very uh, dramatic. I've been down to Vestman, uh, which is where the new islands are being created on the south coast of Iceland. And so this is where you can palpably feel the earth arising and spreading and separating and causing, uh, let's say, difficult living conditions for those who dare to live there. But otherwise, they're very dramatic and continue down the rift. Now, this is the Azores, if you've ever been there. This sort of a tr semi-tropical version of Iceland uh, right in the very center of the uh, Mid-Atlantic mid Ridge so that the islands to the west are actually pulling away from the other group. And it's a beautiful place. It's, a, let's say, a sailor's paradise because you go in nice calm winds in the central North Atlantic, which is generally fair weather, out of the shipping lanes to islands like these that are especially lovely. So these are the goal of many a transatlantic sailor. And because uh, there are not many other places to stop. I, as a mariner, I've always been looking for a new island that I can claim a name after my kids, but uh, I've yet to find one. This is an example of the caldera of the volcanoes that created the Azores. And then you've undoubtedly stopped on this beautiful island, Madeira, which is off the coast of uh, Portugal. And again, it's a volcanic island with these very dramatic seascapes because this is not an active volcanic region, but it is a wearing island with this rough shore and great heights above it. And of course, uh, gets sometimes plagued with landslides and great earthquakes in the area. But it does not have what the northern ridge has, which are these active volcanoes under the sea that are creating great clouds of sulfuric uh, gases coming out of the seabed. And remarkably, there's life down there, thousands of feet deep. And you may have read about these. These are the sea worms that fix sulfur. And there's a, a kind of bacteria that lives in their gut that allows them to process in an anaerobic environment. So there's, there's no light, no chloroform, and they have to gather their own oxygen out of the water, which is very, very little down there. But nonetheless, life is flourishing in these very hot waters that are up to 700 degrees Fahrenheit. And somehow these animals have adapted to plants. They're not really plants. They're sort of proto. Uh, the worms are alive as a, as a worm, but they almost seem like a forest. Uh, and this is an example in uh, marine biology where there are life forms that can survive in these kind of conditions, which then leads some speculation that this is possible on other planets where there is no chloroform or oxygen, and these cr creatures can adapt and somehow thrive. That's not on the menu tonight, though. Now, going over to where we, have, where we were sailing, you see this vast continental shelf and how the coast of North America, uh, one um, mariner, mariner described it as the great ragged shore of, the, of North America because unlike the, the Pacific, which has a narrow shelf and a fairly straight and often harborless coast, other than in British Columbia, Alaska, uh, the eastern seaboard has all these areas that are the outflow of rivers and particularly you can see the great St. Lawrence bay and outflow of the former channel that when the seas were not so high, the, uh, these rivers fl flowing off the continent created great canyons. The St. Lawrence has one out just south of Newfoundland and then the Hudson Canyon is another large one. And that's often an area of great uh, marine life because larger 
pelagic fish and whales go up there to feed, and then there's a lot of mineral runoff from the continent that creates a zone of uh, diversity. So here's what the St. Lawrence looked, back, looked like many millions of years ago uh, before the first ice age. And so you can see that these rivers that come off North America and the Canadian Shield made a multi-channel flow around the islands which have then been left as we know them today. The other feature of North Atlantic is the Great Gulf Stream. And I know this ship sort of bumps over it. There's sort of a line in the water where you can feel a bump when you get into it because actually the uh, salinity and the temperature is quite different than the rest of the North Atlantic, which is so cold. Now, this is the great circulation of the North Atlantic, and it's fed by the tropical waters that came, come up to right where we are and the Arctic waters are giving a, a flow of cold water that come down and collide with the warm water, and that creates the pervasive fog conditions for much of the year. And you can see the, the currents that come just around Newfoundland are quite complicated, and the, um, on the Labrador coast from south of uh, Greenland, that has traditionally been called the ship killer coast because those currents will drive you right onto the rocks if you don't stay far enough off. And then as you cross over toward Iceland and back to northern Europe, you get this tremendous cold water flows that, that actually drop in below the warmer water and create what's been called a sea gale of current flowing 100 nautical miles wide, many uh, miles deep at a certain point as it rushes down off of the uh, Greenland and northern Canadian uh, coast and Iceland, and then it slips under the warmer water of the Gulf Stream. And again, this is one reason why this whole passage on the North Atlantic is so rough, because you have uh, conflicting waves, uh, with strong winds from the Arctic, uh, cold water coming down, creating fog. And so this just generally defines what we already know that is a, a foggy and stormy coast for much of the year. This is what's been called part of the great North Atlantic gyre, because you have the Gulf Stream being, bringing warm water up, the cold water flows down under it, and then it creates these, particularly the subsea uh, recirculation of the ocean's waters. And this is very important because it, it creates a dynamism in the North Atlantic. The Pacific has some of this, but nothing near as dramatic as the North Atlantic. And so that gyre, as it's called, is sort of like a gigantic, uh, circulating heat pump that brings warm water up into the North Atlantic, takes cold water down in the tropics, and then it, as you can see in this illustration, to the lower part, joins the confluence of the Southern Ocean and the convergence with the Antarctic waters, which then goes circulating unimpeded around the Southern Hemisphere. And that, that uh, sort of helps neutralize the most extreme effects of global climate and is watched very carefully by oceanographers because if there's any change in this circulation of the world ocean, then the climate will be quite different. We're not sure how, but we're watching the effect of it. But this is a general illustration of how these currents flow under and over and then around the land masses and create sort of a living uh, energy transfer for the whole ocean. Now, those of us who live on this side of the pond uh, are quite familiar with the Gulf Stream, which is, a, again, a remarkable feature of the Atlantic in that the equatorial current that comes from Africa and the trade winds comes over to the Caribbean and it comes up into the Gulf of Mexico. And then it comes up as a great stream and creates these hot spots all in the central uh, North Atlantic, but above all, it, it sends this warm water north. And uh, this is a stream that was uh, kind of perplexed uh, the sail ship uh, navigators back uh, when Europeans first were coming over here because they came out of the cold, foggy conditions and they came and suddenly there was warm and clear water right off of uh, the North America. Uh, but it, it created, uh, again, bad weather at times and then you can see how warm it is down in the Caribbean and what what the hydrological effect of this is that the, the pressure of the tropical uh, currents that come through spin around the Caribbean basin, then go through the Yucatan Channel, then go up and they circulate in the Gulf of Mexico, but by the pressure of the tropical winds and currents, that creates a kind of a slingshot effect, and then the Florida current races between Cuba and Florida at up to uh, 
four knots down 1,500 feet. And so this tremendous flow of water goes right out up into the North Atlantic uh, at the rate of something like 300 times the flow of the Amazon, um, 40,000 swimming pools going by every second. And so if you're a sailor and you're trying to go between Florida, the Bahamas, much less Cuba, you have to take into account this tremendous flow of warm water that then became charted. Now that if you're sailing out there, you get an update every day of the effects and the position of the main current so that you can safely cross over. Famously, there are races between Massachusetts, Bermuda, and other islands, which are the, the winners are the ones who often know how to handle the, the Gulf Stream current. This is the illustration of the whaling captain, Folger, who first charted the Gulf Stream. And once this was published by Benjamin Franklin, then it was manageable for navigators to understand this great river in the ocean. And today, from satellite, you can see the whirls and the conflicts of the warmer and colder water meeting. And it's charted like this so that uh, the effects of it are here known. And uh, navigators, again, will look at daily information and see how this living river in the ocean is happening. Now, this is the kind of film, film that gets oceanographers very excited, but I'll only give you a little bit of it, lest you get mesmerized by the whirls of this. So these, uh, what they call the meanders, are quite unusual because they will circular, they encompass either cold or warm water. And famously, they'll uh, carry tropical marine life from the, the, the tropics all the way up to the coasts of uh, northern Europe. So here's a warm ring or a cold ring, and these are, they're almost like a big swimming pool that is in the water, part of the ocean. But what it does is give that lovely effect. Uh, does anybody know where this is? Do you live on a palm fringe coast? Anybody from Ireland or Scotland? You know, the, the, the water gets remarkably warm. And then, of course, it goes all the way up to the, uh, the coast of Norway, where they occasionally have sea turtles and tropical fish wash up on the rocks there. Now, back in the tropics, though, the weather is no joke. And uh, those of us who have ever been out in a really tremendous sea storm uh, have a lot of sympathy for a, a sailor like this who's been tossed around. And then you see the water spout. That is a very real danger in the tropical waters. So this is just a tornado that, like on land, is a circulating low point pressure. And then it can come into the ocean and just pick up a tremendous amount of water and anything in it, including uh, small vessels, and toss it around. But uh, the, the greater and more famous version of uh, trouble in the ocean is the uh, hurricane, which is, of course, named after the Mayan god of the wind. And for the uh, North Atlantic, this is the great problem. So these storms usually will develop off the coast of Africa, and they're often fed by hot Sahara winds that blow a lot of dust out, and that gets heated in the atmosphere, creates a, a, uh, an upwelling of heat, which then draws more energy from the sea. It organizes in a low-pressure spiral spinning counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere. And this is, of course, a phenomenon of all the tropics. Now, in the, in the white band here, you see those are the doldrums. Right along the equator, there's often very little wind and a great problem for the sail ships. But up in the tens to 20 latitudes north and south, these great storms develop. And then more f most famous are the ones in Asia, and then the North Atlantic, which come finally hitting land, of course. The Indian Ocean also, they go up into land. The great cyclones are all the same. They're a low pressure sea storm. And then re recently, you've heard that in uh, Hawaii, Mexico, there have been tremendous uh, uh, hurricanes. One just missed Hawaii the other day. And that's very unusual and a sign that the ocean is warming. But in the, our neighborhood in the Atlantic, uh, when they come across the equatorial current from Africa, they come to the islands. And there's a, a, a phenomenon called the convergence zone. Essentially, it centers around Puerto Rico, that if the storm is to the south of those Antilles Islands, they'll go into the basin and then go up into the Gulf of Mexico. If they pass north of that, they tend to swing off um, by the wind patterns and either hit Florida or even up to the northeast. Uh, but they'll often spin out like the one just did the other day that hit Bermuda, and it went off into the sea. And as soon as it hits the cold water, they dissipate. But uh, you've seen, or been in perhaps some of these, the, uh, the great uh, Katrina, which came up into the Yucatan Basin and then Gulf of Mexico, and again, feeding on those hot waters that get head north out of the gap between Yucatan and Cuba, then 
took the water from the Gulf of Mexico, which is the hottest sea in the open ocean, and then grew larger and then did its devastation on New Orleans and other places. So traditionally, uh, sailing instruction is you put that storm on your uh, starboard quarter so you sail the other way. But uh, I've known a few skippers, most famously and Sandy, the captain of the rep reproduction of the HMS Bounty, who sailed right into the storm and lost his ship. And it's no joke. This is where I have my house in Lower Manhattan on Spring Street when Sandy was coming. And uh, with no help from uh, any of the authorities, we went and got our own sandbags and surrounded the block and saved. This is my old house. It was a 200-year-old townhouse that was once a suburban development just north of Wall Street. And we sandbagged the old house, and it actually kept it from getting knocked down, as were many houses. And we were, this house is right on the shore and is already built on sand and uh, landfill. But the water came that high. We had about four feet of water standing on the street, came in like a tsunami, and then receded and knocked out all the power, f flooded places. Six people were drowned in our immediate couple of blocks by getting caught usually in a basement or in a car. And so this is where the weather is getting worse, and uh, that was a particularly terrible combination of forces. Uh, uh, the winds weren't so high, but the surge went all the way up the Hudson River for about 50 miles. And this is uh, up at, by Haverstraw and Stony Point, which is 50 miles up the river. And that demolished the entire marinas and whole rows of houses on the shore, including this houseboat. Um, but uh, that's what's happening. We have to pr be prepared for it. I'll just go back into the, the center. I'll talk a bit about the Sargasso Sea, which is a uh, a very tranquil part where there's a gyre that leaves a sort of a great patch of calm water off the North American coast north of the Caribbean. And it's famous for having a kind of a seaweed in it that mats on the ocean surface, sargassum it's called. And this has been a hazard to navigation because ships would, sail ships go into it, they couldn't get out of it. They get caught in this sort of a, a great mass tangled of the sargassum and all of the fish life and uh, breeding of, of creatures in it. Now you can see there are little fish hiding it. And so it has its own unique ecology, being that many uh, fish and uh, particularly eels will come to spawn and live there and then send, go about out to the greater ocean. And it, uh, it has a feature the seaweed fixes the nitrogen from the ocean and then floats. It's not attached to anything, it just mats out tremendously. Uh, and it uh, is a tropical phenomena because these warm waters and calm seas generally are the perfect habitat for the, all these different creatures, including Portuguese men of war, dorado fish, sea turtles. But most fa famously, it's the Atlantic eel, which then, once it's spawned in the Sargasso, goes to all of its resident rivers in Europe and North America, and even Africa. And so these creatures, again, most curiously, will migrate like uh, pelagic fish and birds tremendous distances just to come back to lay their eggs and spawn in the Sargasso. In the 1700s, and on, until steamships uh, were the established way to get across the sea, ships would sail into that or be driven by a storm, and then they would get caught in the seaweed, and then they couldn't get out. There was not enough wind to push the ship. Long boats would try to pull them out. So back in earlier days, this was considered an area to avoid because whole crews would finally starve and die on the ship, and then the ship would still be fine, and it would be in its rags as a derelict. And so the Navy Captain Maori, who was a great oceanographer, published a chart of where the estimated positions of these ghost ships were as a warning to other sailors to stay well off the Sargasso. The other phenomena of the sea is this Bermuda Triangle where, again, uh, it's almost a, a grand legend. Ships disappear, planes disappear, a flight from Florida once all these planes went off the radar and disappeared. And so to this day, it's a famous area. Now, this is part of the Sargasso also because you have Bermuda, Puerto Rico, then to Florida is the rough dimensions of the Bermuda Triangle. And then it has magnetic anomalies as this compass shows